So I hope that makes sense when I edit this. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany from Brittany Loves Reading and today I'm starting my December wrap up vlog. Come with me through the month as I finish books and I'll let you know what I think about them, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and hopefully, we'll have a good December reading month. I have finished two books. Today is December 5th. I had a slower start to the month, but I have now finished two books, so I need to let you know about those. And unfortunately, we're not starting December off on necessarily a high note, but here we are. The first book I finished is I Know Who You Are by Alice Feeney, and this book angered me to no end. In this book, we follow an actress named Amy Sinclair. Amy Sinclair is doing a movie, when her husband goes missing and the police think she knows more about it than meets the eye. We also follow a second timeline of a little girl named Kira who is six years old when she is kidnapped by a couple whose daughter has passed away and they want her to basically replace their daughter. It is a very dark thriller. Please check the content warnings if you decide to pick this up. And the first 50% of this book was a five-star read for me. I was completely enthralled with the writing of this book, with what was happening in this book. It was very, very heavy, but I could not put it down. I just wanted to know what was going on, how these two timelines fit together, what was happening. I needed to know all the things. However, this was on my list of self-destruct books for this year because I heard the twist was really bad. And while I was reading this book, I could not believe that this book had such low ratings because I was enjoying the first 50% so much. Then at about the 60% mark with about 100 pages left, I started to figure out what was going on and I was in shock. I could not believe that that's the twist we would decide to take in this book. I could have went my whole life without reading that twist and it was subtly brought to our attention. There would be little like breadcrumbs throughout the 100 pages kind of leading us toward the twist. And the more I saw it, the more angered I became and the more frustrated I became because I had been loving this book so much. Then to give me that twist was just so irritating and disappointing. And I ended up giving this two stars. The second book I read was Betting on You by Lynn Painter. This is an arc I had from NetGalley and I needed to read it. It came out, I think near the end of November, 1st of December, and I needed to get around to reading this for review. This book was just middle of the road for me. We follow Charlie and Bailey. They are meeting on a plane as they are kind of going from one parent's house to the other. They're teenagers, they don't hit it off. And then they find out they're working at the same summer amusement park for the summer. They make a bet on two of their friends that are also working on the amusement park of whether they will hook up over the summer. And they become kind of enemies to friends, to lovers, both being able to communicate with each other and understand what it's like to be teenagers of divorced parents who don't live in the same city and have to kind of like fly back and forth. I think the reason this was middle of the road for me was really that I was just not the target audience for this book. This was very YA and I was just not the target audience for this. And that's why I think it was middle of the road for me. I don't think it was anything necessarily against the book. Just I'm not the main demographic for this book. And I ended up giving it three stars. It is December 6th. And yesterday I finished Something in the Water by Katherine Stedmond. This is a book I needed to continue from my Goodreads cleanup vlog. I read the first 124 pages earlier in the year and I needed to finish. The first chapter of this book is so interesting. We drop into this woman burying a body and then we go back in time. And unfortunately, the back in time was very uneventful for me. This is a very slow, slow, slow burn thriller, and it did not really get interesting until about the last hundred pages. And even then, I feel like the first chapter was the most intriguing part of this book. And that's so disappointing because that first chapter really got me so excited. If you see my try a chapter from six months ago when I started this book, I was so excited. And I put it down in the middle of a chapter because I was getting really, really just uninterested as I went through. But the end did pick up a little bit and I am glad I finished it, but it was a slow burn and this was just okay for me and it ended up getting three stars. It is December 9th and I have finished The Last Devil to Die by Richard Osman. And unfortunately, this was my least favorite in the book. I did not dislike it. I gave it three stars and there was a couple chapters in here that really just, I was not okay. And those couple of chapters would have scored this book higher, but it was just a couple of chapters. So like, I couldn't 
really score the book off those couple of chapters. A friend of one of the people in the Thursday Murder Club ends up being shot and killed and it's associated with heroin. And there's missing heroin and the Thursday Murder Club has decided that they are the right people to solve this mystery. And what I've loved about these books in the past might be the thing that I didn't like about it in this book, which is really interesting. In each book, we kind of grab characters as we go along. We pick up a character here, a character there, and they kind of become a part of the Thursday Murder Club. They're not a part of the core group, but they are somebody that we use and the Thursday Murder Club uses to solve the next murder. And I think we went one book too far bringing extra characters with us. Because by the time we get to this book, there is a very large cast of side characters and it got confusing at times. I never felt that in the first three books. So I think we've added about four characters too many. And it just felt a bit muddled for me, the mystery in and of itself. The overarching storyline around the Thursday Murder Club, which had a little bit to do with those chapters that I said I liked a lot and would have been five star chapters, but I can't write a whole book off a handful of chapters, was interesting seeing the progression of the Thursday Murder Club and our main pensioners enjoyed that. I'm still going to continue with this series if and when Richard Osman writes another one. He did say that he is planning on writing another one, but that it will be a while before we get another book. So I'm not even really sure when or if the next book in this series will come out, but this is my least favorite. Three stars, still liked it. Three stars, still a good book. Nothing wrong with the three star book. But to me, it's the weakest in the set of four. It is December 12th and I just finished filming my 24 in 24 books. So I'm not gonna move from this spot and I'm gonna film my wrap up for a couple books too. I finished two books since I last talked to you. The first one is Wreck the Halls by Tessa Bailey. This book was a typical Tessa Bailey book. It's what I come to expect from Tessa Bailey, but there was a bit missing at the beginning. So this follows Beat and Melody. They are both children of rock stars. Their mothers were in a rock band together. The band broke up before they were born, just they were both pregnant at the time the band broke up. There's a lot of mystery surrounding why this band broke up, but their mothers do not talk to each other and they have never seen each other since. Beat and Melody meet once when they are 16 years old and it was for like five minutes. And I wanna preface this because they are now 30. Beat is being blackmailed and he is approached by a producer that will give him a million dollars if he can get his mother's band back together. He ropes in Melody to help him do this and immediately they are best friends, us against the world, the banter is great, but none of that makes sense because they weren't friends first. It is a friends to lovers where the friends part is missing. And it was the only thing I didn't like about this book because the book would have made more sense had that been in it. The second half of the book was stronger than the first half in my opinion. I debated between giving it a four and a three. I ended up giving it a three. Realistically, it's a 3.5, but I don't give half star ratings. So it's a three but I did debate. Really the only issue is I feel like we were missing the backstory to make this romance make sense in the way that was written. The next book I read was Greenwich Park by Katherine Faulkner. I ended up giving this three stars as well. This is not a twisty thriller. If you are here for a twisty thriller, this is not it. I'm okay with not having a twisty thriller. That wasn't my problem. With this book, I actually found it quite engaging as I was reading, but to me, it was very obvious where we were going. And like I said, that's okay. I don't need a twisty thriller. But there was a part at the end, which I cannot talk about, but the last chapter in this book made me knock it down a star. I just felt like it didn't really fit with the rest of the book and was kind of a throwaway ending. In my opinion, I know a lot of people who liked the ending, so I'm just not going to speak about it. But the ending to me felt like a throwaway ending and I did not love the ending, unfortunately. I'm sorry. But I did enjoy my time with the book. I'm going to read Katherine Faulkner's other book. I have it already. I'm excited to read it because I did really enjoy the writing style in this book. It was very easy to read. It was very easy to get through. I will say in this book, we follow three different women. We follow Serena, Helen mostly, but we also follow Serena and Katie, her sister-in-law and her best friend. And we follow them as this woman, Rachel, comes into their lives. Helen is pregnant and Helen goes to her, basically Lamaze classes. That's not what they're called, but that's basically where she goes. She meets Rachel, who is also pregnant. And Rachel all of a sudden is like, just showing up wherever she is and inserting herself in Helen's life. And it gets kind of awkward and weird. The friends and the sister-in-law meet her and it all kind of surrounds 
Why is Rachel inserting herself into her life? But what I was saying was we follow these three different women and I think the audiobook would have been really, really helped by having three different narrators. It had the same narrator who didn't really change their voice for each perspective. And if I wasn't paying attention, I was getting a bit confused of who we were following of these three women. That's not the author's fault, that's a production issue. But I did wanna mention that, that if you're thinking of the audiobook, I, I think it would have been better with more than one narrator. I really did like the writing style of this book. I'm excited to read the next book and I think I might enjoy the next book better going into it knowing that it's not a twisty thriller. It is December 15th and I finished two books since I've last spoken to you, so I need to let you know about them. The first one I finished was a a Little Magic by Lindsay Lanza. I adored this Christmas romance. It was such a good friends to lovers Christmas romance. The two timelines from when they were friends as children and into young adulthood mixed with the current timeline of them coming back together were weaving together so well. And I just enjoyed my time with this book so much. In this book, we follow Theo and Ellie. Theo is Ellie's older brother's best friend. He is best friends with Ezra. They meet when Ellie is nine, and I think that would have made him about 11. Every year, Theo comes and spends Christmas with Ezra and his family. They have boarding school and various things going on, and Theo always comes to their house for Christmas. Ellie's family is Jewish, and they kind of blend Hanukkah and Christmas into this kind of holiday in this winter wonderland of Vermont, and every year it's just so magical. As they grow older, obviously a romance kind of kindles as these two kind of become each other's first loves. And we see that develop in the past timeline. In the present timeline, Ellie has gone back to Vermont to go to this kind of winter wonderland that used to be owned by Theo's family and is not anymore. She is part of a blog that does like travel blogging and she's going to do a blog on this location. She arrives, does not expect to see Theo because they do not own this property any longer, finds out he recently just bought it, they get snowed in to a cabin on the property and kind of have to work through what happened to their relationship back when Ellie went to college. A part of this book though is Ellie and Ellie has lupus and has known she's had lupus since she was about eight or nine years old. Her mother really went into an overprotective state with Ellie and really did some detrimental things to Ellie's mental health and her formative years trying to protect Ellie being overprotective of her illness. When Ellie goes to college, she cuts ties with her mother. And we see Ellie in therapy kind of working through how to move forward with her life, with this barrier with her mother, and working around toxic family relationships. And I really did appreciate that look into therapy and how to deal with family members that maybe are not necessarily healthy for you to have in your life, or how to mend relationships if there is room to be mended through therapy. And I really did like how they conquered that. And I also really did like the look of Ellie's chronic illness in this book of lupus and how Ellie fights to take control of her health and fights to have bodily autonomy. And I really, really, really enjoyed the look at both of these things. For all these reasons, I end up giving it five stars and I definitely wanna read this author's debut. I haven't read it and I'm going to next year for sure. The next book I read was The Last Housewife by Megan Miranda. This I'm gonna keep really short and sweet because honestly, this was a book that exists and I read it. Thank you, Aoife, for that wonderful description of a book like this because it's the only thing that I have to say. This follows Avery. Avery lives on these rental properties. She's in charge of keeping up these rental properties. A year previous, her best friend Sadie, who was the daughter of the owner of these rental properties, ended up being found dead at the cliffs of this seaside town. Everyone assumes that Sadie committed suicide, but Avery doesn't believe that to be the case and starts investigating into Sadie's death the year after it happened. There was nothing wrong with this book, nothing that I can say, oh, I didn't like this. It was very middle of the road and I have very little opinions on it. So 
that's really all I have to say. It was a book that exists and I read it. It is the 19th of December and I have finished another book. I finished The Other Mothers by Katherine Faulkner. I actually finished this a couple days ago and didn't tell you, but that's okay. We're updating you now. This is the second book this month that I've read by Katherine Faulkner and I did like this one more. The first one I read was The Debut. This is their second book and you could really see the advancement in their writing between book one and book two. One of my main critiques of the first book was that the audiobook didn't have dual narrators. I didn't change my star rating for that, but I would have preferred different narrators because it was hard to keep track of the perspectives. Luckily, this one did, and it follows two perspectives, Sophie and Tash. Tash is a freelance journalist who is investigating the death of a nanny, Sophie. The nanny is attached to her mother's group. She doesn't know this at first, but realizes there is a connection as she starts to investigate and do these people that she is hanging out with and having playdates with, do they have anything to do with Sophie's death? We also follow Sophie in a past timeline leading up to her death. We see maybe what was happening in her life at the time, what led up to it. We go up to literally 19 minutes before her death, one minute before. We count it down. It's really, really interesting in the way that that's written and how the timeline kind of plays as we see Tosh in the present timeline, looking into it, and Sophie leading up to it. I also think I preferred this a little bit more because in this one, the characters were more likable, the ones that were following, because we know they're removed from the crime. Tash is investigating it. She's a reporter. She was very likable. I liked Tash. Sophie, obviously our victim, was also a very likable character. So I preferred that to the first book that had more unlikable characters or unreliable narrators. I ended up giving this four stars. It was a fun time. It was a quick read. It's not a twisty thriller. You kind of get breadcrumbs as you go along to get to the final outcome, but I did enjoy the ride and I find the author's writing very, very digestible. Definitely will pick up another thriller by this author in the future. So I'm not gonna lie, I have not updated you on a couple of books. This week was Sprintmas and I've been daily vlogging for Sprintmas and I forgot to also vlog for wrap ups and I haven't talked to you this entire time. I finished two books, so I haven't finished that much this week. They were a bit more dense reads, and I also DNF'd a book, so like, we won't talk about that. But I did finish two books, and I do need to let you know about them. The first book I finished was The Cartographers by Peng Shepard. This book is a dark academia book around maps. I have not read a Dark Academia book in a minute, and this just reminded me why I love the genre so much and makes me want to pick up some more really, really soon because I just had such a fabulous time with this book. I gave it four stars. It was a great ride. We follow Nell. Nell is working at Classics, which is a place to make reproduction, cheap reproduction maps. But Nell used to be a very well-known assistant to her father who was a famous cartographer. She was going to take over for him at the New York Public Library at one point, but they had a rift about seven years ago and Nell has not spoken to him since. They had a riff over a box of maps that she found in the basement of the library and he was very upset that she would bring them to him. She's always been confused of why this was so upsetting, but he actually got her fired after this encounter. And like I said, they haven't spoken since. At the start of this book, he actually actually ends up being found dead at his desk. It looks like it's a heart attack. And she goes back to the library to see what's going on. In his desk, she finds one of the maps from this box, but not one of the ones she was excited about originally. It's like a gas station map. She's like, why would he keep this? It's not worth anything. It's it's a gas station map. She takes it home though and like puts it into like a list of maps, like a public record. And all of a sudden people are trying to break into the New York Public Library to get this map. And she's like, what is so special about this map? I'm confused. And it leads her into a secret society called the Cartographers. And it kind of links to past family secrets and people that her parents knew when they were in college. And it's very intriguing. The magic system in this is, it's a slight magic system. It's not super magic. This is more magical realism than like fantasy. But there is a magic element to this book as well. And I just had a fabulous time reading this book and getting back into dark academia. I am going to look into more by this author because this is my first book by the author and I really did enjoy it. 
and I would like to see what else the author has in store. The other book I finished was Dot Hutchinson's The Butterfly Garden. This is a dark book. Please check trigger warnings. It's very, very, very dark. It follows two FBI agents after they have uncovered a serial killer. And what he did was capture many, many women. He kept them captured, tattooed butterfly wings on their body and kept them and eventually murdered some of them. And kept them and did horrific things to them while they were captured. It's, it's very dark. It's very dark. In this book, we follow kind of two timelines, but also one timeline. I'll explain what I mean by that is we follow the detectives, the FBI, as they're interviewing one of the girls, Maya. She is one of the girls that kind of came out needing less medical attention than some of the other girls. So she is the first one that they are able to interview. They're sitting down to interview Maya and we go back and forth between them asking her questions and her telling them what she witnessed, what happened to her, what she saw, what happened to all the girls, what was going on in this garden that he made with his butterflies, which were the girls. She explains what's going on. So when we're in her perspective, it's almost like we're in a past timeline of seeing what was going on in this garden, but obviously it's her telling it to the detective. So it feels like two timelines, but it is kind of just one. And to do a read this dark and do it well, and for it not to come across insensitive, yes, it's very disturbing, but it's done well and tastefully. If that makes sense, I'm looking for a better word, but that's the best one that I have, is a testament to the author. It's a hard thing to write something this dark and do it well. The only thing that I didn't love about this was the last 15 pages. We had a twist at the end of this book that I don't think really made a lot of sense because this did feel realistic up until that point. And the twist kind of took it out of that realistic quality. And I don't think this needed to be a twisty thriller. It was more horrific thriller horror. And I think it was okay to live in that space. I don't think it needed a twist at the end. And I don't think the twist really made sense. But that was the only little critique that I have, I still ended up giving this four stars and I most likely will be continuing with this series. It follows the detectives, I believe, in the next book and like each book is a different case. I think that's how the series goes. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I think is going on. Today is December 27th and I'm here with a car update on a couple of books that I read over the holidays. The first one I read was an Audible original called Once Upon a Christmas Carol. This was really cute. It was really short. I needed to finish a book very quickly to finish the Bookmon prompt that I needed to do and I went with this one because it was like two hours long. It was very, very short. This was a cute story. I forget all the characters' names at this point. It follows a singer-songwriter who gets dropped by her label and goes home for Christmas. She runs into an ex and his young daughter. He's now a widower and they bond over their love of music and helping in the school talent show. It definitely felt like a Hallmark Christmas movie and it was cute. It was really cute. I gave it three stars and it was, it was cute. The next book I read was A Wilderness of Stars. I had a NetGalley arc of this. This came out a while ago. This has been sitting on my NetGalley shelf for a while. And unfortunately, this may be the biggest disappointment of the year. It wasn't horrible. I gave it three stars. But considering that I've given both of Shane Earnshaw's books five stars previously, the only other two I have read, I've given five stars. This just wasn't to par. It wasn't as good as the other two, and it was a disappointment to me. This follows a young girl called the Astronomer. She is the last astronomer, and she is trying to find the architect. She does find the architect, and they are trying to follow a map that is basically tattooed to her body. And why they are doing this and where they're going and everything around this book took a very long time for us to figure out. And I think it took a while because the author wanted to drop the twist on us, but it took so long that I didn't care what was happening by the time we got to it. I just watched them run away from people for an entire book. And it was just a circle of traveling without ever telling me what the destination was or what the point. There was a little bit about an illness currently plaguing all of the people that are surrounding them. And I didn't really know the tie-in until the illness again until the end. It was very vague and I think Shay Earnshaw was trying to be atmospheric which I would say is actually the strong suit of the author. It's the reason I loved the previous two books. The atmosphere in those books top tier. This one just missed the mark for me on the plot and by the time we got to the point I didn't care any longer and this book is going to be very very forgettable for me and that breaks my heart because I have five starred the previous two books I've read by this author. I love Shane Earnshaw. I'm not giving up on 
one, Shane Earnshaw. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to read some more because I'm just going to put this one off as a disappointment and hope that the next book I read is going to be better. So today is the 28th of December and I read If the Shoe Fits by Julie Murphy. This is the first book in the Meant to Be series. This is a series of contemporary romance retellings of fairy tales. Each book is written by a different author. This is the first in the series, but not the first that I've read. Earlier this year, I read By the Book by Jasmine Guillory, which is book two in a Beauty and the Beast retelling. This is book one in a Cinderella retelling. I gave the second book five stars. I really liked it and I really did enjoy this one too, but I did only give it four. This was a really cute contemporary romance and it takes place during a dating show called Before Midnight and it follows the stepdaughter of one of the producers on the show, Cindy. Cindy is a plus size main character. I love to see it and she is falling in love with Henry, who is our male protagonist on the show. Henry is the heir to a design company and Cindy actually went to design school so they do have a lot in common and she likes to design shoes and that's kind of the tie-in to Cinderella, Cindy, Cinderella, Before Midnight, shoes, you know, all that stuff. For me though, I did find the second book had more Easter eggs to the original Beauty and the Beast story. This is a retelling, but it didn't hit as hard on the retelling aspect as the second book did, but I still enjoyed it. Like I gave it four stars. I had a fantastic time with it. It was really, really cute. And I did find it did the reality dating show Bachelor really well. I read The True Love Experiment earlier this year, and that was the part of it that I missed out on was I didn't feel like it hit the reality TV show vibes as much as I wanted. And this absolutely did. I have book three in this on my Kindle for an arc and I need to get to that. It is a Little Mermaid retelling. And I know that Christina Lauren is currently finishing up the fourth book. It comes out sometime in 2024. I think it's a Rapunzel retelling, but don't quote me on that. That's coming out soon. So I'd like to be caught up before that release. So even though this didn't hit it as hard as the second book, I still really enjoyed it. And I do really like these contemporary romance takes on fairy tales. So today is December 29th and I have two books that I want to talk to you about. This week, I'm really just focusing on cleaning up some of those Timmy's TBR books that I need to clean up and finish. And I finished two of them and I'm making good progress and I'm very proud of myself. So the first one I finished was Pretty Little Wife by Darby Kane. This is a thriller following a wife. Lila is the wife of Aaron. He is a teacher at the local high school, I believe, and he teaches math and also field hockey. He is the coach. One morning, Aaron does not show up for school and the principal of the school shows up at Lila's house and is like is Aaron here it's very weird that he's not at the school and she's like he's at the school he went to the school look for his car and she knows his car is there and she knows his body is in it because she put it there however now the car is missing Aaron's body is missing she doesn't know where he's gone she's wondering did I not actually kill him? I thought I killed my husband and there's reasons that she wanted to kill him, which you get into in this book, but did she not succeed? And where is Aaron's body? Where is he? Is he alive? Is he dead? Who knows what is going on? We don't know where he is or where his body is, if he's alive, if he's dead. Lila doesn't know. She thought she did and she doesn't know. Lila's like, I tried to kill him. Where is he? Or does someone know I killed him and took his body and is now like got his body? There's a lot going on and we don't really know what's going on for a lot of this book either, but we follow that ride. The tagline on this book is shouldn't a dead husband stay dead? And Lila certainly thinks that he should. This was a very quick read. It was very digestible. The writing was really easy to follow and I fell into this thriller and it read very, very quickly. I read it in less than 24 hours. I did slightly find the ending and the twist a bit predictable at times, but overall I had a fun time with this book. It was a fun time and I ended up giving it four stars. The second book I finished was How to Fake It in Hollywood by Ava Wilder. I read Ava Wilder's newest book earlier this year and absolutely loved that book. It is a five star. It's one of my favorite books that I read this year. It didn't make it into my top 10, but it was really, really close. And I was hoping to love this just as much. Unfortunately, this just only became three stars for me. This book follows Gray and Ethan. She is 27, 28. He is almost 40. So there is an age gap in here. And they are both Hollywood actors and actresses. He was very famous in his young adult years and has gone through a lot of stuff. His best friend who he did a lot of movies with has passed and he's got a drinking problem and he's trying to re-enter the acting world. 
Gray has had a couple of roles and is a working actress, but she wants her big break and they have the same publicist. So they decide to go into a fake publicity stunt relationship. Obviously they catch feelings and things happen from there. It really felt a little bit like Ben Affleck fan fiction, to be honest. This is very much a Ben Affleck character and it felt like I was kind of reading a book inspired on Ben Affleck's life, which was okay. But to be honest, I didn't love these characters and their romance was a little bit messy for me. And I only ended up giving this three stars. But I am completely caught up on this author's backlist. And obviously both of these books are set around Hollywood actors and actresses. So I'm assuming that's kind of what the author is going to continue to write. But I will wait patiently and see. So December is now over and I realized I never told you about my last book of the month because it was New Year's and it was a busy time. So let's do that. The last book I read in 2023 was Tempting Owzed by Victoria Aveline. This is the fourth book in the Cocania series. I've been reading it slowly throughout the year with a few different booktubers and this is the fourth one. This one got three stars that's pretty typical of this series for me and there's a few reasons for that. A lot of the books are very very similar which does happen in alien romance so that's not super odd but I do find that we go back in time at the start of every book and rehash things we've already seen from a different character's perspective and for me that feels very repetitive and it's not my favorite thing about these books. In this book we follow Alex and obviously Ozed. Alex we meet at the start slash end of the previous book. Alex is separated from our main female character from book three gets a concussion, is lost in the woods, and is found by Alzad. Alzad is kind of the head guard who we see in the first book. He is the brother of our main character, Theo, in the first book. And we also see him acting as a guard to the human females and kind of keeping them safe on this planet. So we've kind of met him before. And it's an alien romance. There's really nothing else to say about that because, like I said, they are very much the same as the previous three books. I am enjoying the series, but I do not like that we kind of keep rehashing the same things over and over. I would like to see a little bit of a variation in the books, especially as we get into five, six, and seven. We'll see if I get that. My favorite books in the series were definitely the earlier books in the series. I think I liked book two the most, but they are kind of starting to all run together a little bit for me as well. But that was the last book I read in December, so now it's time to look at some stats. In December, I read 17 books, which resulted in 5,786 pages. My best book of the month was my only five star this month, which was A Little Magic by Lindsay Lanza. And my worst book of the month was my only two star this month, which was I Know Who You Are by Alice Feeney. That is the end of December's wrap up. I've already jumped into January and have already started my first book. So I will see you in that month wrap up and also in the subsequent videos and vlogs that follow. What was your favorite read of December? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.